Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna talk about all things plants, maybe herbs. We'll see what happens, but we're ready to hear some of your questions, but we're ready to look also at show and tells. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. But, so I will probably take care of some cut flower questions or perennials, but we've got a lot of perennial enthusiasts and all around horticulturalists here, so let's find out who is here. And I'm gonna throw it over to you and start first with Dr. Stephen Still. Thank you, Diane. Well, I am a emeritus professor from Ohio State University, and also I'm the executive director of the Perennial Plant Association, which is a national group uh, dealing with perennials, obviously. And one of my favorite uh, things each time I'm on the show is to talk about the perennial plant of the year. And in 2017, it is the butterfly weed. Uh, the scientific name for those that are interested is the Sclepius tuberosa. And it's an orange flowered uh, uh, plant that is uh, about uh, two to three feet tall. And what is uh, interesting about the plant, it has a lot of characteristics. One, it's a, a native plant. And that's obviously a very interesting to many of our viewers. The other thing is it's a po great pollinator plant. Butterfly weeds, uh, or butterfly weed can be attractive to the, the monarch butterfly, it's attractive to bees, beetles, uh, and other uh, insects. So it's a great uh, plant to consider. It's best in full sun. It's great in a drought type of situation. Earlier, I spent uh, my career at Kansas State University, and the, the plants there out on the prairie are beautiful in the June-July uh, period. So. Uh, Great, uh, and of course it's gonna match very well with the monarch pollinator movement that we have here uh, in North America. So uh, great plant, Asclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed. Oh, that's excellent. We were having a hard time not giving you a standing ovation while you're talking about it. That's a really great plant, and I love that orange color. Thank you, Stephen. Now let's go in the middle to Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, I'm a horticulture educator at the University of Illinois Extension covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. And this evening, my sh first show and tell is Greek columnar basil. Um, this is a plant um, that grows narrower rather than wider as many of our basil plants do. This one will get about um, 18 inches tall or so, with, but only uh, get a spread of maybe eight to 12 inches wide. So it's a very nice column look. Um, it actually would be nice in a formal type garden if you were to put it in there, but it works great in containers. What's also great about this plant is that um, it's late to flower. So uh, unlike the other basils where you have to constantly keep cutting it back, this one you would not have to cut back quite so regularly. But when you do get ready to do so, you're gonna pinch it back right above where you see two leaves, for, two sets of leaves forming, um, and that'll keep that plant fuller and bushier looking throughout the season. But um, just a nice, clean looking plant. Um, stays like that all summer, just gets a bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit taller, and a little bit bushier and fuller. Um, so enjoy it, growing it, and also enjoy um, the flavor of it as well. It's really a great plant in the garden. Good, thank you, Jennifer. And now to you, David Robson. Thanks, Diane. I'm David Robson. I'm a horticultural specialist here at the University of Illinois, as well as a pesticide safety specialist. I know a little bit about trees, shrubs, lawns, and then uh, most of the insects, diseases, and weeds on some of the plants. My uh, show and tell is a little bit different. It's also an herb. It's also a member of the mint family, just like the basil. Uh, we're looking at times in front of me, and there are a lot of different types of times. We have some spicy orange, we have some uh, lime, and you notice that it has sort of a yellowish green color, maybe more of a chartreuse color. Uh, this spicy orange has almost uh, like a very fine cut leaf to it, uh, and again, sort of a red stem to it. We have one called Magic Carpet, 
We have our traditional French, but there's also an English time too. The French and the English tend to be a little bit more upright. Uh, we have a woolly time, which has these fine hairs on it, which is just a wonderful little low growing plant. And in fact, uh, that's the advantage of all of these times is that with the exception of the ones that we tend to use for the culinary purposes, like the French and the English time, they all tend to be low growing. And I didn't want to, um, eliminate Dune Valley, which has a yellow and even sometimes a pinkish cast to some of the leaves. So it's almost a tricolor thyme. Uh, the low growing thymes are great ground covers where you have a hot, sunny location, but don't overwater them. Keep them on a drier side. If you have a clay soil, you might want to amend that, maybe raise it up. Uh, they're great for trough gardens. Uh, when I've grown them, I've seen them in uh, areas where the soil just drains very quickly because overwatering will cause them to rot more than anything else. If you do wonderfully, they'll just keep growing and growing. And before you know, you have a lot of time on your hands. Oh, I <laughs> I knew it was coming. I didn't know how. <laughs> this is so nice to see all oh, six of these in comparison. And there's probably oh. maybe 15, 20 more different ones. And so you can get a really nice thyme garden. Very good. Thank you for not doing another pun. Okay. okay. Well, this is a very appropriate Mid-American Gardener quiz. Let's go to it next. What distinguishes an herb from a spice? A, where it's derived from the plant. B, where it is grown. C, its height. D, its coloration. A, where it is derived from the plant. Herbs are taken from the leafy parts of plants, while spices include things like seeds and roots. Okay, we had lots of herbs on the set. Love show and tell. Well, let's go to the next segment and it's about uh, joining me for um, a Mid-American Gardener field trip on Thursday, May 25th. We're gonna visit Danville Gardens for a special gardening demonstration and then Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana to learn um, Shane's favorite perennials. And you'll have time to shop at both places. Then it's back to Campbell Hall here at the studio for dinner and a seat in the live studio audience, live studio audience for the 25th anniversary special episode of Mid-American Gardener. We'll have coffee and cake and plenty of garden talk after the big show. So visit wil.illinois.edu slash will travel for more information or you can call 217-333-7300. Just think, 25 years. Wow. Two, we're two weeks shy of 25 years, so that's pretty interesting. All right, well, we want to go to your questions on the phone line, and we're going to start with yours, Bob, on line two, and it's about crepe myrtle. Hi, Bob. Thank you for taking my questions. You're uh, welcome. I've got crepe myrtle has been doing fine for about three years, maybe four years. Now, this year it looks like it's all dead, except that the bottom is starting to have some new growth come out. Uh, are they susceptible of this weather around here, or can you tell me what's going on? Okay, who wants to dig in on that one? Well, I have a crepe myrtle, and okay. mine dies back to the ground every single year, produces probably two feet of growth, three feet of growth every year and blooms, and then dies back down during the winter. So when yours didn't die back, I think that's great. And I do know that there's some hardy types, mm -hmm. uh, but I've also seen people who have them out in the middle of the field, unprotected, in central Illinois and they do well. So they'll never get a tree. There'll always be that shrub, but you will get, you know, the great flowers. Uh, and fortunately we don't have to prune them because it seems like nature does take care of that. <laughs> we have to prune off. Right, yeah, prune, prune right, it back. prune yeah. it back, uh, prune the dead. But I would say, Bob, that's great. You know, at least you're getting basal growth to it and just fertilize it and hopefully it's not gonna drown anymore in the weather that we have, but uh, it should bloom later this summer for you. They bloom on uh, the first year's wood. Okay, so good question about crepe myrtle. A lot of people think you can't grow it here, but you can. Could you, you just... grow it in Columbus? Yes, same, okay. same, same type of thing where it's a, a plant that dies back and it's shrubby. You My just... sister has one in Girard, it grows yep. well there. Mm -hmm. 
You just can't get used to the tree look when you go a little <laughs> right. farther south. No, no nice exfoliating or pattern you can, bark. Or you can move farther south and then get right. used to that. And in southern Illinois, they do have some taller sure. specimens. Okay, well, thank you, Bob, for that. And let's go next to Faye's question about foxglove, and she's on line three. Hello, Faye. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, I have recently purchased uh, two beautiful foxglove plants, and I was uh, looking up on the line how to take care of them, and it says that they are one of the most poisonous plants, dangerous to children and animals, and uh, that you should get rid of them, and I just need some opinions or some uh, information. That's a little harsh, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that poor plant. <laughs> um, I... I'll try to sure. handle that. Uh, I, obviously, I think foxglove is uh, has poisonous uh, quantities. Certainly, I would not uh, eat uh, parts of the plant, but I don't think it's something that I would remove from my garden. Foxglove is a traditional, classical perennial that's been in the gardens for centuries, probably. So. Uh, you know, if you have cats that are going out and eating something like that, maybe you wouldn't want to do that or, or children, but it's not something that, oh, you have to get out of the garden, it's going to be really tragic. I remember teaching the plant when the first President Bush was treated with digitalis for his heart condition. And that was a really good teaching moment, which teachers love that, because we could say, you know, this is the plant it's, that you're studying. And so it is a heart regulator. So you wouldn't want your cat's hearts regulated. <laughs> cats won't eat it. Cats are too smart. Dogs, yeah, but <laughs> cats, no. But you don't want to be messing around, like you said. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think that was a little harsh, but now you know why. All right, let's go to uh, line four and Carol's question about geraniums. Hi, Carol. Hi there, I overwintered my geraniums in a heated garage, and now they have gotten real long stems on them and blooms on the end. And my question is, shall I cut them off and try to re-root them, or can I take the old plant and cut it back and replant it? Well, you should be able to see um, where there's some green growth down at the bottom, where there might be what we call nodes, so little like uh, bud areas. Um, you could cut it back to those, just pick a point and cut it back to that point. Um, I would recommend for future that you do that more so early April um, and then bring it at night if it's going to frost, but um, doing that early on and, and then by now it would look like a really nice full plant. So it's, it's a little late to do it, but I would still go ahead and do it because otherwise you're just going to have a spindly growth plant that you're not going to enjoy. So go ahead and, and cut that back at this time. Um, you, you'll see where I'm talking about. There's, there's joints in the, in, the, in the branch or in the stem area that you can cut those back to and they should flush out from there. Okay, very good. Wow, we're getting one question for everyone in order. This is great. Let's go to line five, and I guess her, your name is Tana. Uh, you have a milkweed question. Hi, line Hi. five. Hi, I'm Tana. T -A -N -A. Oh, Tana. Oh, That's nice to meet you. Sound. So anyway, I'm asking about milkweed. Um, where I went to college in my hometown in Western, they had a five-acre field of it, by the way, Wow. Uh, testing it for uh, fiber, uh, appropriate, appropriate uh, whether it was appropriate for fiber for fab. But anyway, um, how far from a farm field would I be a little more welcome to plant milkweed? We were just talking about this <laughs> yeah. before the show. Okay, I want to hear the answer. You were saying that you grew up on the farm and. You still have but that I mean, hard... she's wondering how far from a farm field would she be welcome to plant or encourage because the farmer wouldn't like you. So what do you, what do you think? Well, if it was the, uh, the butterfly weed, the one I just spoke of, then uh, that would not be a major problem. If it's a classical milkweed, uh, that the five acres you're speaking of, then uh, those uh, seeds will with their nice uh, uh, parachute type of uh, materials on it will float the wrong way. So uh, uh, you know, quarter mile, I'm not sure, but it's a... Uh, I'd <laughs> say even further but, than yeah. that, but... But I don't think you'd have too much to worry about because uh, most of our 
farm fields are treated so they would take out the plants mm -hmm. that might even germinate. So I, I don't think that would be too much of a concern. And, and I do believe that the majority of our farmers in our areas have increasing awareness of how important they are. So um, they're not gonna be too upset with you if you grow it next to, to their fields. And in your own garden, Yes. I was yeah. saying how they're so lovely, how they'll come up as an edging plant, just an inch from the front border, and, and they're very easy to pull. I try not to do it too much, because I do want to leave some. There is an, another one in the Asclepius yes. group, would be Asclepius incarnata, which is a swamp milkweed. Right. So it would not be so as aggressive as far as releasing seeds, and it's a fairly attractive ornamental. I don't think it's as nice as butterfly weed myself, but swamp milkweed is another ornamental that could be used. And I can see it growing natively along the mm -hmm. river, so if you have a, a wet area, you've got you've rain three, garden. and rain garden, mm -hmm. yeah, you have all of these choices then. And with the traditional milkweed of your concern, you can certainly trim those off before those seeds um, mm -hmm. pods would pop. You could pop the, or trim those seed pods off and then you wouldn't have to worry about them um, floating in the air and um, okay. pollen spreading. Something for everyone in the milkweed family. <laughs> okay, let's go to Elizabeth's questions next. And she's on line six. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I have heard that neonicotinoids are used by nurseries and that these can kill bees even if you're not using them, but you've just bought plants that have used them. And I want to know, is there any way that we can tell if a nursery has used these neonicotinoids? Okay, well, and there's been some, um, lately, some uh, issues going around the United States because one of the big box stores had some butterfly weed that said treated with neonicotinoids on the tag. And so uh, some of the companies do actually say on the tag that they have treated that plant with the neonics. Um, in this case, it was a mislabeling, or that's what the company mm. has said. And so those butterfly weeds that you could find at the box stores, and those are common box stores, uh, aren't really treated. Um, it's, uh, and they have, they have definitely said that they are not treated. Look on the label. Uh, since neonicotinoids have to carry a label on their use, if you look at any of the neonicotinoids on the market, there is a big warning sign, and that's supposed to also go down to the label. Look at the label. If it doesn't have that little B or doesn't say neonicotinoids on it, I'm going to say it's pretty good that it probably hasn't been treated. Can't say it 100%. Ask the people at the nursery, at the garden center. Uh, it's another reason to get plants maybe more at a garden center and a regular nursery as opposed to a big box store because you can ask them specifically and they actually can tell you on that. You are right, it can affect bees. It can affect somewhat the caterpillars, not as strongly. Uh, and in most cases, you're probably not gonna see a lot of damage. Uh, but you know, do read the label, do ask, and then maybe look at more of the plants at a true garden center, nursery, greenhouse, those local uh, business owners as opposed to the great big box stores. Okay. But it's a good question, a good thing yeah. uh, to worry about, especially nationally with that little incident that occurred. Well, thank you for answering that. Very good. Well, let's go around the table and do our second either email or show and tell. So, Stephen, we'll start with you. Okay, very good. Well, I have a, uh, a, a photo here, and the uh, information on it says, Hi, I watch your show every week. Please identify the flower in these photos. It is my personal trainer's garden. She got it from her grandmother. Thank you very much. And the, the plant that is on the screen now is uh, a, sometimes it's called evening primrose, or it's in the evening primrose family. The uh, genus, and I'll spell that for you, it's sometimes pronounced Enothera, or sometimes Enothera, but it's O-E-N-O-T-H-E-R-A. This particular species is Enothera fruticosa. 
uh, and it's a sun drop or southern sun drop. It's a plant that's actually native. It runs all the way from Nova Scotia to Florida, so it's perfectly hardy here in our Mid-America Garden viewing uh, area. Uh, there are many species in this particular genus, actually 145, so I don't know if our panelists know that wow. or not. I do now. <laughs> it's not related to the true uh, primrose, uh, which uh, we see as primula, uh, and most of these are typically evening uh, blooming plants, but this is a day bloomer. Uh, it's a tough and reliable perennial. Sometimes people may say it's a little bit too aggressive in some of the, the garden area. It's about 16, 24 inches uh, tall. Drought tolerant, again, uh, it's a great plant for the border or the meadow uh, area. Um, so, uh, and I want to pass along uh, and talk about the pass along plant. Uh, that's how many of our plants get in the garden. It's interesting that uh, this uh, viewer stated it, the person came from her grandmother. And so a lot of our, our plants, like, where'd you get that? Well, my grandmother had it or my aunt mm -hmm. uh, had it in her garden. And so this is a, a plant that's been around for a long time. Uh, it was actually introduced uh, in, from the United States to England in 1612. Uh, Interesting. Actually, sorry, not England, Padua, Italy, in the Padua Botanical Garden there. So uh, hmm. native plant, it's good. It's great sun flowering type of plant. Very interesting. All right, thank you. And now, Jennifer. So I have a viewer's question, and the viewer um, says that they have a sp uh, grass growing in their asparagus, and what can they do to get rid of the grass other than pulling it, and can they use a salt mixture? Um, so the first part of this answer is do not use a salt mixture. A salt mixture will actually destroy your soil structure, which over time could actually kill the asparagus. So please avoid doing that. Um, the next part of the answer is mechanical control does work well. Uh, with a grass, though, we're generally speaking of a, probably a perennial grass, um, so it's gonna, it could be difficult depending on the, the, the root structure of that grass. Um, what they could do at this time is to go out and harvest all of your asparagus and then take a sponge and um, touch the tops of the grass uh, with a gly glyphosate, or round, with, which is sometimes called Roundup, um, brand name, um, over the top of that. Uh, if you wait until you've, you're done harvesting, um, you could also try that on a little bit broader area. Uh, if you are able to remove it for future, for annual germinating weeds, uh, you could try a product called Preen as well on that area, but that will not take out the perennial grasses. Mm -hmm. um, so I brought some show and tell asparagus with me from my own garden, which I've been harvesting now for several weeks. Oh, um, so it's very year. early this year. Yes. I do notice that with lots of rain, that one can pull grasses a little bit easier. Yeah. So don't wait for the driest day. I would do it like now, right after the show. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait till the show's over and then go out and start pulling those grasses. Okay, David, what have you got for us? Well, my email from a listener is, when is the best time to plant grass seed in central Illinois? And I'm gonna say, if it's a cool season grass, fall is the best time. And in central Illinois, if you look at it from Springfield, Peoria, and then go your map, and I think we could say Interstate 74, and that hits Columbus, Ohio area, uh, September is probably the best time. You don't have any weed competition. You're gonna have nine months of cool growing conditions before the hot summer. For cool season grasses like bluegrass, the fescues, ryegrass, the best time. Second best time is probably early April. You are gonna have that potential for weed invasion, particularly crabgrass. There are some methods that you can kind of control that crabgrass, but it controls some of the grass seed. The other thing I would say is warm season grasses. If you can find the warm season grass seeds, most of them are plugs or sprigs, but if you can find the seed, uh, the middle of May is probably a good time to do that. Uh, and then of course, as long as you have the nice conditions, you can always sod. And sod's good for small areas if you want to uh, clean up a little bit of damage, maybe from a dog or something else. Sod's something always to consider. Okay, thank you very much. We're kinda gonna try to sneak in another question. Let's go to Rosalie's question on Iris on line three. Hi, Rosalie. 
I've got uh, about four different iris beds, and two of them, uh, the iris were looking just fine. And uh, just about a week or so ago when I got back from a two-week trip, it looks like they're they're just rotting and kind of laying over, and I don't know if it's water damage or what it might be. Okay. Who wants to dig in? we got a little bit of time. Sure. I would like to suggest that it, it could be uh, uh, the iris bore that has created uh, uh, damage and uh, created some uh, tissue issues, a lot of rain right now, then you've got uh, probably some great uh, rotting occurring, and that's what is causing the problem. So. And she can take a pen knife and she should be able to get down to that rotted area and she may be able to find that bore in there, which mm -hmm. would give her a clue that it, it is the bore too. Okay, or so lots of issues with irises this year. We want to thank each of you for watching and we want to say congratulations to Jeff Omer for being on the sh with the show for several years. Thanks for being here. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.